Tila. Hello, and welcome to a very special Council of the First Ones Valentine's edition. I'm your host, Kelly. Joining me, as usual, is Dave and Sean. How are you guys doing? Hey, Kelly. I just got back from a toy show, and I bought probably way too much. The previous, like, three shows I was at, uh, I didn't buy anything at all, so I was really surprised at how amazing this last show was. So, yeah, I've got... The toy show fever right now. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have the toy show fever, but I always have toy fever. That's right. there. (laughs) Well, I know I'm in toy fair withdrawal since they moved it, but Dave, I see you brought two special guests. Would you like to introduce them to us? You know, I, I, I came across them. I thought they were the cutest couple ever. And this is a Valentine's Day episode. So here we go. I want to introduce you to Jonathan Martin and to Emily Ann Ashby. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello. Thank you for having me. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. And for our listeners who might not know, Emily, you star in the Tila and the Masters of the Universe fan slash audition video that's been taking Facebook and YouTube by storm. (laughs) Yes, that is me. (laughs) Since you mentioned that it's an audition tape, for those who don't know how roles are given, what is the process so people can understand why you're calling this an audition tape? versus what I guess what us old timers know as the reading because we see that on TV. Yes, yes. And your typical standard audition would be, you know, walking in or doing self-tape auditions against a blue screen. um, And that's pretty standard. Um, However, we had a very big opportunity. Um, We had a connection um, through our manager and he basically said we could do a really killer audition to really showcase me as this role and um, us being the couple that we are Mm -hmm. and Jonathan's background in directing and in the film industry, we thought, you know, we could do this pretty typical, right? But that doesn't stand out. That doesn't really fully showcase my capabilities, especially in the action Um, And so we really wanted to showcase my action abilities with this. And the best way is not on a blue screen. Um, That's not going to sell. And so we did a full, you know, five, six minute short film really showcasing. And there's no way that you can't possibly visualize me as that character now that I have fully costumed and (laughs) and I've, you know, shown that. Right. And and so we also wanted it to be a piece that we could use as an action reel for me as well in the future. Yeah, it was, um, and you're right, you're right, uh, Kelly, that normally, yeah, you just, you get the opportunity to audition, you go in, and and this is, you know, and we'll get to the, what we know and don't know about the Masters of the Universe movie and where, where it currently stands, but, but like Emily mentioned, we actually share the same manager, and uh, which makes things a little convenient. And uh, they had a they had just done a film with some people associated now with the Masters of the Universe film. And so that opened up an opportunity. And as we discussed this, we said, well, let's just make, you know, grab the bull by the horns and make our own destiny try and happen. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and we say this right off the top. You know, we, it's not like, hey, we made this. Give it to her now. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome, Hollywood, right? Like, we, we know that's not how it's done, you know? Like, we know that's not it is, but it's a pretty audacious, um, it's a really audacious throwing your hat in the ring yeah. uh, type of effort here. And uh, and normally you don't even put it online, but that was uh, that's part of the strategy you could say uh to get it out there that we've uh, that we've worked with with our manager and stuff like that and so so it's it's fairly unusual to see something like this but also saying what emily said you know worst case no matter what happens at the end um we have a film that's really cool that's a lot of fun and uh worst case it it stands as a fun piece of uh non-official math of the universe uh live action cinema and and one thing I'll also add, Kelly, is um, 
typically, yes, auditions are done a certain way, but you hear this and it happens throughout Hollywood and actors actually go in above and beyond. And for instance, um, you have the Lord of the Rings, um, Elijah, Wood. Elijah Wood and his yeah. audition. Um, and so you see it where actors go above and beyond and really showcase themselves as, the, as this character. Um, and that goes a long ways too as well. And at the end of the day, there's no guarantee. Um, but I view it as you only have one shot to to make a good first impression. So, you know, sometimes if you really, really want to sell yourself on something, you got to take a step up. You know, you can't just be standing in front of blue screen all the time expecting people to just hand you roles either, you know. And, right. and just, yeah. And, and just to elaborate just a little bit more on the Elijah Wood, if anybody hadn't heard about that. You know, 20 plus years ago, he hears about Lord of the Rings being made. He wanted to get on Peter Jackson's radar. He's only like 18 or 19 at this time. And so he just dressed himself in a cloak and went around Griffiths Park in Los Angeles and filmed himself as a hobbit as his tape and <laughs> sent it out. Now, it's my knowledge that's never been released, but it's a story that's recounted and all that. And of course, they sent it off, got it to the casting director, sent it off, and the rest is history. But uh, these these things kind of sometimes happen as well. So so there is some precedent. I'm not sure this, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure that anybody's put it out there so publicly, you know, before something's gone on. But uh, but hey, that's sometimes you got to roll the dice. Another part of it is we we wanted to see the fans take on this um, again. This was intended as an audition video, not as a fan film. However, there's no better joy in actually seeing what the true fans think about it. So, what better way to get feedback and to showcase uh, yourself and your work? And I was really blown away by it. And, you know, I thought this is just so special what you've done. And, you know, I wanted to say, you know, best of luck with, you know, pursuing this role. And, uh, I, you know, like you said, even if nothing comes of it, you're still going to have just an incredible, uh, you know, showpiece for uh, any future auditions. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have uh, I, I guess I'll jump in really quick here. Have, have either of you been fans of the Masters of the Universe <laughs> brand? <laughs> uh okay okay cool yeah 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 no i've i've definitely have been yeah for sure like i i grew up with it i am a child of the 80s and so um as uh i was telling another person you know the greatest the greatest christmas gift i think i ever got to this day and i just found the photo of it too was when i got eternia for christmas and oh. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is a sad part to that story. I no longer have it. You know, because <laughs> my mom gave away like all my He-Man and all my toys when I was I wasn't even like twelve. I was like nine. Wow. I just like she just gave them away, and I'm like, what? what? You know, it's like there was this 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 mentality that was there, and and so that was sad. And uh, without, you know, that's an understatement. But yeah, so I actually just found the photo because the way I remembered it was they had hid it in the back room. And so I didn't even see it there under the tree or anything like that. And I come in and they're like, well, there's one more gift. And I go in and it's this giant wrapped thing that must have been as tall as I was. Right. And and I do the math and I realize because my dad was telling me he got it for something like 40 bucks. So it was on oh, clearance because wow. those didn't sell well, oh, right, oh, at the wow. time. That's right, so, yeah. So he yeah. got it on a clearance whenever he got it. And because I looked it up, I guess the original retail was like 90 bucks or something like that. And so right. um, so that's how he got it. Um, so, well, he was like, yeah, it was great. <laughs> and so, um, and. And now you could get it for ten thousand dollars in box, but um, yeah. you know, so there you go. But but yeah, it was uh, it was really cool, and it must have been as tall as I was, and and uh, you know that was just you know I could still remember the excitement opening it, and then when I saw the photo, I was like, yeah, I guess I was only like a couple inches taller than the box at the time, wow. and so uh, yeah, so so He Man was always a big thing, and and, and to be honest, I. I didn't necessarily watch the cartoon. I think I was a little too old, uh, too young, excuse me, to um, to kind of comprehend it at that point, if that makes sense. Like I would have only been maybe two or three, something like that. And so I wasn't quite cartoon age yet, 
but the toys absolutely as i got you know there was a sweet spot that i fell into so i always had that love for it and i remember I, one of my earliest movie memories is seeing the masters of the universe movie and saying to my dad like who is that like half the time <laughs> and uh, like but then also recognizing like oh i have him and why does beast man not look like beast man and stuff like that so <laughs> it was you know in my young mind trying to comprehend it but um and not knowing who the f wildor was but like you know <laughs> kind of that, like there were little things like but uh but then of course you know as, as things go you know, there was there was Ninja Turtles. Then eventually there was Star Wars, um, mm -hmm. which I got really into Star Wars. And then but I've always had an affinity for He-Man and things yeah. that came up with it. And uh, and and but more recently, I would say probably in like the last four or five years, I've really kind of gotten back into uh, Motu. And and uh, I think Origins helped with that a little bit, helped accelerate that. But I was I was buying the books, I was buying the uh, um, some of the literature and stuff like that that was out there, and you know, looking in and and what have you. So uh, so I've started rebuilding my collection with Origins. Nice. <laughs> so nice. so yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Emily loves it. She's like, oh, a new toy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the stash of toys that well, he has not even opened. Well, because, well, I like to open them, right? I don't necessarily like to keep a box. I used to keep things in a box. And then and then I was like, well, that's no fun. And then so I started opening them. And I got a nephew, and I wanted to expose him to it and stuff like that. But I have I have a grand plan. So if anybody can help me with this, I want to build, like, three once uh, Stick Mountain comes out. And I definitely have pre-ordered the new Eternia, because how could I not? And... Um, and so I've done that, and uh, I want to like build these dioramas that oh. I actually have like the scene, and then they're like almost like museum setups, right? So they have like the yeah. case around them, and then but there's a big battle scene <laughs> for each one, <laughs> and that's what I want to do. I want to put them like around like the living room, and and like have it like you know so you could walk around it. I was like that would be cool. Then, then you know it's there, and then and then I could open a door, <laughs> and then I could take them out to play with one, but I want to right or like look at him and articulate it. So that's there and then i'll kind of uh segue into emily getting into it so oh. um th this has been more of a, a hard and fast introduction <laughs> more into <laughs> so, for um, a little bit of backstory on me i was born so late in the 80s i'm really a 90s kid and so i didn't even get to you know know he man and the masters of the universe um, and neither did my brother. We, 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 we didn't see any of the cartoons. We didn't know anything about the toys. We really got introduced uh, to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that was kind of our action heroine at the time. And, uh, but I always loved that. I loved action figures. In fact, it's funny because I had all my Barbie dolls. I had all the girly things, but I'd always steal my brother's action figures. And so... <laughs> So for me, it's always been um, uh, something I loved was, was action figures and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, but when Jonathan and I were just talking and he's got all the toys, um, <laughs> just to be clear, he's got a, a ton. And uh, he's looking at his Tila action figure and, you know, thinking, man, you really look like Tila. And so, <laughs> this just actually stemmed from this, you know, looking at this toy and seeing, look, she really looks like Tila. And um, there's a photo, and when we did the um, interview with Dad at Arms, it's actually pretty funny because he picked up on it, and we can send it to you. There's a photo in Masters of the Universe Revelation that Jonathan sent to me, and he was like, this is you, and especially you. And the look on her face, the hair, the everything. And um, so he sends it over to our manager and was like, doesn't she look exactly like Tila? And so that's where it kind of stemmed from. And that was my introduction to Tila. So um, from there, you know, I obviously, Jonathan, you know, kind of introduced me to Masters of the Universe and the backstory of it and and looking into, you know, Tila. But I also watched the uh, Revelation series too as well. Yeah. And so she's found out how awesome He-Man is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and so she's gotten in there. And then I have to say this too. And then even the Masterverse toy, I got her that, and of course she wears the hair down with that, with that head. And I remember I mentioned my dad with the E-Man thing, so he's always been familiar with it. I showed him that, and he looks at it, and he's all like, so did you have this custom made to look like Emily? Yeah, 
He thought like, well, he, made toys. Well, yeah, so he's like this, and he's just like, it's uncanny. And so um, so that's some of the fun there as well. So, yeah, yeah, it's kind of fun. So I'm a new fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. welcome. The, the funny thing is you've established you have a type when it comes to women, and He-Man started the ball rolling with Tila being one of those influences in your life as a child, well, probably. No, right? Little did I know that I would end up yeah. with Tila, right? Like, yeah. there is, like that, that that would come on into it. What's funny to me is is typically when people talk about their childhood Christmases, they always go to, it, it was Castle Grayskull. Because, like, for me, it was that way. And I'm sure for many others, it's that. It's like, when we interview you, it's like, no, you went baller. You just go, I got a tournia. And then it's like, yeah. and I, I also am dating Tila. And it's like, I don't know what else. To, you're going to pull the power sword out any second here. Right. And just, okay, there's the trifecta. We're done, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. You know it has the power sword. Yeah, yeah there. Yeah, true. So, okay, I don't. I, uh, he's living in Castle Grayskull. That's the next. Well, there, there it is. We'll like, I mean, dropped, right? Like, there. Yeah, it is. yeah. I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even think about that too much. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and you know, and you bring up Eternia. I didn't even realize until probably about half a year ago. Go like the value that Eternia was going for because I just I was just kind of looking it up right like hey yeah, maybe yeah. I wanted to buy it again and I was like what like that <laughs> kind of I was like excuse me so um, there was only four thousand of them made in the eighties oh you see I didn't know that I didn't know that so it was very limited <laughs> and and they didn't sell well right because I guess no. it was higher price most even of them for that sold time. most of them sold in Europe. Interesting. So the fact that I had one and I grew up in Houston, so I'm this kid in Houston, Texas. And I'll tell you what I can remember. I can remember. I, I don't know if we're in a Walmart or where we were. I don't think it was a Toys R Us, but I remember the first time I laid eyes on it as a kid um, and uh, seeing it and just kind of being awed by it. But there was like a stack of them, you know, <laughs> like they wow, weren't moving, wow. you know, there must have been. I would say it was definitely at least two on top of each other, right? In a stack, like kind of a square stack. So it would have been four or six of them at the time. And I'm, I have a visual memory, right? Like sometimes I'm not the best with names, but I, I'm pretty visual as far as that goes. And so um, and so I could remember that. I can remember like the price thing on top of it, which I can't remember. You know, my dad, the one that bought it, right? And remembered that. And so, wow. So I, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> there was only 4,000 of these made. And I had one of them. That's good. You, you you did a good job there, Kelly. You now you make me sicker that like <laughs> that that the that the that the sad fall from grace of my mom well, just yeah. giving these things away. Well, the, well, the pre-order. There's only a little over eight thousand of those yeah. being made. Yeah, exactly. So I was hoping that they get to the collector's item. Yeah, yeah, I know for sure. So I'm kind of like, you know, I'm excited, but I like to open my toys. So, you know, like <laughs> it's it's one of those things. And and I'll tell you this, guys, too. This is it. It totally worked. You know, I could remember, you know, the car going on the um, on the monorail and going through that. And it worked uh, up until the day that I never saw it again. I know that it worked. He-Man was first, and then very quickly it was the real Ghostbusters. And then, like, I didn't even know what Star Wars was. I didn't I, I didn't know what it was. Um, and, and so he, man, so my dad, he would travel around Houston to go see all his clients. And there was like an outlet store in Houston. I think it was called best or something like that at the time. And anybody who's listening from the Houston area from this era might know what I'm talking about. And he, he bought all the he mans that he got for me, um, like on clearance. So he, these were all clearance. He must have gotten them for like two dollars each. Oh, nice. That's what he got them, right? And wow. so he, so he, that's what he would give me. It was kind of like his, like I've been away, you know, like his way of saying that he loved me, you know. And and he would give me a he man, right, when he came home from work, if he had long, if he had a long day and stuff like that. And it's not that I had every single he man. That's not what I'm saying here, right? But I realize now this must have all been like at the end of '86, '87. Right, that this was happening, because um, that's when everything was on clearance and the line was starting to die. Right, right, right. and mm -hmm. and so that because I think Eternia comes out in '87, right? But it's like the end of '87, like literally at the end of the line, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I'm sure somebody knows for sure. 
Um, and so that's why, you know, I think that's why I was able to get some of these things because, you know, they were, they were dirt cheap for the time and, and they were on the way out. But for me, it was all brand new and the best thing ever. And so that's, that's another part of the fondness that I've always had for He-Man. Like He-Man for me and the Master of the Universe, there's always been a backstory of like love to it, right? It's not just uh, uh, an appreciation because it was just a cool toy and all that. It was just, there was, there was always kind of that, that, um, familiar love and fatherly love that came with it. And so, so it's always been very special for me for that reason, I think as well. And now the fact that I get to share it with the woman I love <laughs> and, and bring her, right? it's all the love and, and, you know, with this being actual Valentine's day episode of love, and family <laughs> and, and all that i think that's uh I, that kind of helps ties it all in together to have to have that and uh and in fact we're liking it so much more we're talking about for the wedding cake doing the topper of he-man and Tila. this was um uh, our friend colt who you know dotted arms he uh shared with us this adorable photo of him and his wife at their wedding and they had he-man and tila for the toppers yeah yeah and so what i was thinking is like right. well, we have the masterverse tila that looks like emily so I we know. don't we need don't that have to make a toy for so me. i need a customized head that looks like me on top of he-man <laughs> and then so if there's anybody out there who knows you know who i need to talk to to get a custom head to put on a he-man masterverse figure so i could have a wedding cake topper with that by all means let me know well and that's awesome that you're introducing emily to masters of the universe like this and are you looking forward to seeing his place like totally taken over by master of the universe toys well eventually it's going to be our place david you know oh. so we've oh. had these discussions on how we're going to deck our house out in toys you know without people right thinking we're crazy people, but we probably have them just, you know, everywhere. They, they, they'll, they'll find their yeah. living quarters you know, within nooks and crannies and bookshelves. They'll use their own room. Uh, yeah, you know? they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll come on in. Yeah, when they build the life-size Skeletor, we'll make sure that he has his own bedroom and that we tuck him in at night. And so <laughs> there it is. We'll tell him the story. There, there is the life-size Havoc staff and uh, Keldor sword already, so... The life-size Skeletor is just around the corner. It's oh. got to come on in, you know. I I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I have been eyeing that. I actually just saw Sideshow had to buy one, get 50% off. And I'm just like, oh, man. But, you know, we, we're we talking about a wedding here soon. So got to save <laughs> yeah. a little money as far as that <laughs> yeah. goes. I mean, speaking of Valentine's <laughs> episode and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, it's uh, we got that. So, you know, maybe there's some splurges i've got to wait on but you know well, we did um we did actually pre-order for him um <laughs> side note because he part of this after we did this audition was he really wanted to get me um the tweeter head tila which was part of the inspiration on the costume design um and we, and we have have two different designs um uh, arts of tila that we referenced and so i can send those to you but um so that's part of the design and so he wanted to get me the statue and so we have my tila now and we we're thinking you know over by you know the bed where you have the um on the nightstand. On nightstand right you know i could have my tila but we need to have him like a kind of a matching skeletor so we actually found <laughs> one on a sideshow that uh we're ordering yeah, for him, we, so. Uh, so you know him, right. him's and hers it's either that or <laughs> yeah. one or the other <laughs> so we we've got we've got we've got we've got our future planned out oh two going <laughs> yeah, on yeah exactly so, yeah so now now that i'm back into the faith you could say <laughs> right like <laughs> it's, it's there and uh you know it's not going anywhere you know, I was going to ask Emily, uh, so are there any toys that you collect? You mentioned you love Ninja, Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I, I do love Ninja Turtles, but actually my biggest um, geeky nerd out is uh, Transformers, uh, oh, hands down. Wow. I love Bumblebee. Um, in fact, Jonathan got me for my birthday. So speaking <laughs> of toys, we get each other toys. Um, and it was actually my favorite gift. I'm, I'm pretty simplistic. It is a Bumblebee that converts from the classic beetle. And But it, it's kind of confusing because all the instructions were in, um, I think, Chinese. In Japanese. In Japanese. Oh, yeah. but, but, but it's actually very complicated to convert him. So it took us a couple of times. More but, complicated than the normal. But, but it, it was amazing. 
Um, so I have that bumblebee and I have several other bumblebees at my house. Um, I also love Optimus Prime. He's my second favorite, but bumblebee is like my heart. <laughs> I just nice. adore, like adore bumblebee. And um, so, yeah, I just, I've always loved Transformers. It just is my geek out. It's a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah. No, no. So that's that's what I have for toys and Tila now. So Jonathan's bought me several Tilas. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. taking care of business, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. This is gonna be filled with Transformers. Transformers. It's just gonna be Transformers. <laughs> well, we have to pick, you know. I mean, so we, have, we have to have a Transformer room, I, and then I, we'll I, have yeah. the mobile room, I mean, and. I mean, you know, and not to get too sidetracked with it, but I mean, but aside from He-Man, my other big one was the real Ghostbusters. Those were those were the two that, you know, before anything else, that's that's what I came, you know, into. And so when the, when they did the redos of the real Ghostbusters, I definitely picked those up. But there's only like six of those that they did, maybe eight. So there's definitely not as many of the new things as far as it goes. But yeah, we're going to have to maybe pick and choose, but I don't know. But do Transformers? we? And Modu is always going to be there, so yeah. that's that's mm -hmm. the tops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So basically, growing up, you guys would have been my best friends no matter what, because you picked yeah. every single one from my childhood that were my favorites. Uh, like, yeah. like Tra Transformers, the movie blew my mind as a kid. That was it's still to this day one of my favorite movies of all time. Masters oh, was my very yeah, first toy line. Oh yeah. Well. I was wondering, you said Optimus, and I'm like, oh, I, I hope I hope you took it well when they, that scene happened in the movie, depending. But yeah, yeah. but uh, he went out in a blaze of glory, at least. But uh, yeah. and, and, and Ghostbusters w was like so freaking cool. And when I found out you couldn't actually do that for a living, I actually needed like a week of my life to recover from realizing I couldn't do that. It really <laughs> bugged me. <laughs> yeah. Tragedy. Yeah. You and me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I remember going to Ghostbusters 2, dressing up as a Ghostbuster with, ba nice. with basically a backpack and like a Ghostbusters t-shirt if I had, you know, that available. And I think I went and saw it probably like five or six times, you know, in the, in the theater. And I'd, I'd stand up yeah. in the seat like I was trust the ghost like you know <laughs> and then i got older and i realized how much better ghostbusters was than ghostbusters 2 and i was like as a kid i was like oh ghostbusters 2 for yeah. sure and then i got older again i was like oh you know ghostbusters really is <laughs> superior film so anyway, oh, yeah yeah so, definitely yeah so i i kind of went with that so yeah it would have been fun and maybe you would have talked my mom or whatever was going on there off the ledge of just giving away oh. my stuff. <laughs> Yeah. I, I would have been the kid probably trying to grab them from her and yeah, I would have kept yeah. them at my house and then be like, hey, I know they're yours, but you can come over anytime and play with yeah. them still. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> any any story like that always, it makes my heart just break for oh, anyone my because my mom and dad didn't do that to me and I was always happy that they let me keep my stuff. So. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I... My mom did it behind my back, guys. Like she that makes it, it work. Behind my back, <laughs> like this yeah. wasn't like, like this, like oh hey yeah, I'll, I'll give it to the, I'll give it away. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, this is first world problems, right? But it's yeah. just like, it's just like at the end of the day, it was just like I never would have had that go down, you know. And it's just what it had to happen. It had to be done when I wasn't watching. So yeah, it was, but uh, it is what it is. Well, so what made you want to become an actress? Um, so I am an avid book reader. Um, so I love just being taken away into a whole new world. And so fantasy is probably, fantasy and sci-fi are definitely my favorites. Um, so I, I love the, the world building aspect of that. Um, I started in school in musical theater. And so I did a lot of that. Um, and I enjoyed it. I never loved being on stage. That really wasn't what I wanted. Uh, I, I was actually, I had stage fright too as well. So I had to get over that, but I just didn't feel that that was really what I wanted to do as far as acting. And so, um, I was reading a book one day and it's this, um, incredible series. It's called Red Queen and it is a fantasy. And I was just, you know, thinking, you know, what character would I be if this film was to come to life? If this was to be a movie, what character would I be? You know, and I kept thinking on that. And then I started thinking about film and 
and and the fact was I had never even tried to do film. And part of my issues with stage and theater was I didn't love being on stage, but I loved the acting aspect. And so I got to thinking and then I was like, you know what, I'm going to, you know, try out film. And so I got into acting classes and I just kept going at it. And I thought, you know, if I really enjoy this, then I'm going to keep going at it. And mm -hmm. so that's where it all started. I, I found a love for it. Um, for me, film is a little bit, despite that there's still a large amount of people on a film set, it's a little more intimate in a way. Um, and I never had to deal with that, that stage fear or any of it. And so, yeah, I just found a love for that. But for me, I think the most enjoyable thing is reading a character on a page, envisioning yourself in that character and actually making that character come to life and mm -hmm. and hearing, you know, what the audience feels about that. For me, that's the most enjoyable aspect of it. And that's where I get really thrilled um, with acting is, is really just making that character that whole story it's a big collaboration of a bunch of characters to make that story come to life and for me that's the ultimate joy no oh, thank you so much for sharing that with us and well, uh you. no i'm sure fans are are you know wanting to know more about that trailer like how you put it together what were the challenges yeah could you talk a little bit about that so you want to talk about tila and the masters of the universe eh we've yeah. uh prime yeah okay all right um, take us to eternia <laughs> let's let's go we you know that, that our, by the way our first tagline was going to be uh, uh um the power returns and then we realized that they used that for like the revelations trailer and all that sort of stuff i was like well i can't put the power returns so we did actually change when we did the little 20 second teaser to get this going we did say return to eternia but initially we were thinking of using a place called the little sahara and it literally looks like the sahara desert and uh, a lot of people may, in film, probably the most famous thing that it was familiar with was in uh, Napoleon Dynamite, when the grandma is on the uh, the RV or the ATV and uh, she breaks her like, you know, arm or something jumping a hill, right? So that's, that's the little Sahara at Utah that they filmed that at. We, by the moment that we probably committed to it, I want to say we were probably filming it, even though it's only five or six minutes, uh, with some of the elements that we had to build from scratch, like the costume, like the sword, like the staff, um, getting a little bit of the choreography and stuff, uh, maybe three or four weeks, like to get certain things ready to go and 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 primed, um, get the team together, which wasn't a big team and all that. So that's kind of the backstory. And then we had to get it done fast once we once we finished it. We had to we had to move fast once we filmed. Um, and 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 so when it came time to filming it and prepping for it, Emily, we had a really good guy that came through my film festival. He had just had a film and he was actually touring through the United States with this film. He's Italian and he plays Siam, <laughs> uh, the names that we came up with right in the film. And uh, so he was our stunt coordinator uh, on there. And he actually worked in Hong Kong and Shanghai for uh, for over 12 years as a stuntman. So he had that Hong Kong uh, action style that kind of came in, Christian Kang Bacini. Hmm. And, and so we were able to get him to come on in and train with Emily for about a week before we started filming. Although that sounds easier said than done. Um, I'll jump into this and then I'll let Emily give a little bit more backstory. So the first day that we went out to film, uh, which wasn't in the Little Sahara. It was in an area known as the Knowles Recreation Area. It was an honest-to-goodness sandstorm that started up and basically ruined the whole shoot. Uh, there's only about two shots in the in the final film that are from that sandstorm. It's when it pan the camera pans up and reveals Tila for the first time, and we had this delicious wind. It was so great initially, and you have this great wind that's blowing, so it creates the kind of epic, the wind is blowing and all that type of vibe. And then there's the shot that kind of does the Matrix type shot, like the Bruce Lee, where she puts out her hand, like as the guy's racing her. And you can see it in the film. The sky isn't quite blue. It's <laughs> kind of like the, the, the clouds are coming with the sandstorm. And that was about it. And so we had a whole uh, very close, but very, um, but still different version of the film that we were going to film there. And 
I mean, she was getting body slammed. She was getting like actually like wrestled and stuff in there. And we had, but because of the sandstorm and the lack of continuity and some other things that came about uh, when we were able to start filming again about a week and a half later, um, we had to do what you ultimately saw in the end result. But there was different story beats. There was actually some more dialogue and things like that. When our friend, so Christian, you know, you got his little you got his backstory um so he came in to work with me and we only had about a week um before we were initially planning on doing the filming and i do have a background in martial arts um so i did training for muay thai judo jiu-jitsu and boxing and so but we really wanted to give tila a little bit of a we definitely wanted her to be a bad a um first things first uh, but we wanted her to have a certain fight style and when we were coming up with, and also for budgeting purposes, um, we were coming up with the costume design of Tila. And, you know, initially I was thinking we would have the shield, we'd have the sword, we'd have the staff, we'd have it all. Um, but when we were budgeting that and how much it would cost, we were like, wow, this is expensive. So we came up with a little bit of a different story on how Tila would use her staff actually to, you know, use it as a weapon. And so with that, we we choreographed based on that. And and eventually at some point she would get a sword. And so we had worked on that choreography. I only was able to train with Christian for a week. Unfortunately, we couldn't train with any of our other stunt actors. We had a stunt actor that was in Hawaii auditioning for a big thing. And so we were like, you know what? We're just gonna have to do it. Well, the we day had, of. we had well, we had one, but then he dropped out. I think that people didn't want to be the initial person that got beat up. However, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I they understand. just get ruined because they don't really—they just to... get trashed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, but I mean, that still had to be convincing and all that. But that being said, the initial thing—I'm going to jump in. Like I said, the the difference in the story was this: the first guy who gets beat up after he gets wrecked, he comes back into the fight, mm -hmm. and it becomes a four-way battle. Mm -hmm. over and it's like they were jumping over swords they were like one person gets it knocked out there was a whole big four-way battle that was coming in and that's what we had initially choreographed mm -hmm. and then this guy literally dropped just drops out like the two days before we're going to shoot and doesn't really give a reason right and and so we had to find another guy and he yes. commits to do it and then he drops out the day before Oh, no. Well, we're supposed to do all this, yeah, but he was yeah, a stunt man, right? So we were going to kind of modify some things. And so from that, we were like, well, we, we got two days to film this. When normally you want a week to film a scene like this, by the way. Normally, you know, that was something Christian emphasized, just knowing what I know. You know, if we were on a big Hollywood film, you would you would take a week to shoot a scene like this. The way that it is, every single shot would look glorious and yeah. perfect, right? You'd make sure everything was done, you know, so it was just amazing. And, you know, for a big scene, right? It depended how many big scenes there were in the film, of course. But um, but you would go in with that. And, um, but, you know, with those dropouts, with the sandstorm, with some things like that, we had to, we really had to regroup and kind of rethink the scene in many ways uh, of how we were doing it because you're also racing the sun, right? Well, like, we're not filming at night. So each day we only had what we have. We have to start at a certain time and we have, you have to end when it's sunset. And, you know, and the reality is the last hour, it will not look like the first, you know, few yeah. hours, right? So, you know, when she pulls the power sword at the end, that is at the golden hour. That's in the final hour of light mm -hmm. that gives well, it that kind of, glorious war and we thing. only had the two days to do it because we had to fly our dp back in from los angeles and so we had the two days and it actually was just before his birthday too so it was on a, his birthday yeah he was actually filming on his birthday yeah and so he did us a huge solid in that and so we're like we got to get it in the two days and so that's where the um redesign of the second half the initial half was um the the beating up the first guy was pretty similar other than the rest of the choreography, we actually ended up doing it the day of Christian had an idea and he talked with Jonathan and they came up with a better plan on how to do it so we could accomplish it in one day for a large portion of that fight. 
And so when they did that, we actually did shot by shot where we, he trained us on what we were doing. We rehearsed a couple times and then we just shot it. And oh, oh, that yeah. second day we did 77 setups, um, which is absurd from, you know, sun up <laughs> until sundown. Right. And we got that final power shot and yeah, it was insane. And it was still pretty hot. We're out in the desert, even though it was, it was, it, it was hot. It was like, okay, okay stop. You weren't fighting people. But, anyway, yeah. yeah. so we were like actually legit. Fighting, yeah, we were just sweating. We were like actually exhausted. But I think that because of that, it really came across. It was really dry. Stuff. It was yeah. really dry. Like that, that was for sure. Like it was really dry. I could say like that. I wouldn't say it was so hot, but it was, it was, it, it was the dry. You needed a lot of Gatorade and a lot of water. Like, yeah. It, it and was, we, we didn't take breaks. We actually just, yeah, we, couldn't. we just were like, here, grab a little bite of trail mix. Keep going. You yeah. Know? And, that, and, yeah. We had to do it that way to be, to make it. But it was funny because in Utah, the, uh, the, the, the sun sets an hour later, not just because of the time zone change, but because you're further north. And I remember Matt, the DP, who was great. Uh, he's all like, okay, we only have like another hour of light. And I'm like, bro, we have like two and a half hours of light left. Like, <laughs> like we, like, we're going to keep going. He's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, like, like just we're fine. Trust me, you know? And so, um, there were some things like that, but, uh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And like she said, we had to come in and in fact, we changed it even the night before. So after we filmed the first day, this was the first day back after we filmed it, we were still figuring out like, Oh, we still have to do all this scene. We still have to do this and all that. And we came back because it was a two and a half hour drive back to where we had to go. So it was two and a half hours each way. So we were basically doing about five hour drives each day on top of that. Um, and, uh, and we had to come up with, we actually came up with everything that you ultimately saw. Like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change this. We're going to change this dialogue. We're going to come in so that we could get this scene. So there was an element of like, while it was very prepared and planned, we had storyboards and stuff like that. Um, and obviously a little script, we still, we were still operating, um, on the seat of our pants and moving like the way that we had to shoot it and, and making it very, um, shot to shot hour by hour, getting this, um, figured out like, and you know, we had a team of professionals, like there was never any doubt that we were going to get this. I can honestly say that I, I never doubted that we were going to be able to capture what we needed to do. The only question was, are we going to have to like spend a little more money for a third day? Like, which didn't seem pop, like really likely. Um, but that was, that was kind of the backstory. And obviously we have a lot of tales from the making of, but yeah. that was, that was the initial setup and, re, and, and thing that we went in. I mean, the only, I'll say this, the only regret I have, and I only realized it like a week after we released the film was because I forgot that they did these. I just completely forgot that they did it was I wish that we had as an Easter egg after the credits doing the morality lesson of the day of the episode type <laughs> yeah, of thing, yeah. and having her coming in and saying, what did we learn today? Like and, an adult version. Yeah. Too, like make it pretty thing. funny, you know? Yeah. Like, what did we yeah. learn? And like, it's like, we learned that you should never like, you know, judge a book by its cover, you know, something <laughs> like that. Just because you're three on one doesn't mean <laughs> that you're not that you're yeah you know, that you're outnumbering your opponent you know whatever it is yeah. you know something really cheesy I wish that we had done something like that but again that that came after we released it you know that, that's not something that's easy to go back in time with like um you know and and I'll answer this you know some people have been like well, where's he man or like you know I have seen a few comments like he man should have you know that was really cool but what should have happened was he then comes out at the end and saves the day. And I'm like, well, I think you've missed the point. <laughs> like, what's going on here? And then you know, stuff like now, that. Like, that would ruined it if he man came to rescue Tila. Because Tila is the warrior goddess. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. she is. And 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 you know, at the end of the day, again, keep in mind. I understand if people don't pick up on the fact that this is an audition film first, right? That this is an audition, almost never seen before type of uh, attempt at, 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 at putting the hat into the ring. But, you know, I, I could say it was fan film second, although I did tell Emily when, and I think I said it to the DP too, uh, when we, when she was drawing the power sword and she was putting it on, I did think I said, I think there's going to be some fans that like, they're, they're going to lose their mind in a good way, but some of them are going to, this is going to piss them off so much. <laughs> and it's just like, like, like as far as that goes. But, 
but but it wasn't made for that, right? Yeah. Like we wanted to showcase Tila in her strength, mm -hmm. in her power, um, in her uh, really just dominating a uh, dominating presence presence on screen is what we really wanted to showcase because again the ultimate goal was to showcase Emily as Tila embodying this role. Yes. And 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 what's more powerful than her drawing the power sword at the end and 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 unfortunately a lot of people you know we've had a lot of comments where people say like uh, I get chills down my spine when they <laughs> see that Right. Which, we, which we absolutely love. And Kelly, you're so right, because it's funny to me when people say that, because granted, you know, I've come to know Tila more recently, but, you know, in doing my research with her, her warrior background, right? And, you know, she's described as one who even trained Prince Adam. And so, you know, with that and, and, and that description of her, you know, can't she hold her own? that that seems so logical right and so it was interesting when we got those comments where it's like well I don't think you quite know Tila as a character as the standalone character that she is right and so that's what we were really trying to showcase just her her abilities without He-Man right as much as we love He-Man we would love to incorporate He-Man this is really about Tila and and then the other question I'll answer is people are like, well, who are these other three dudes? It's like, well, there's something called budget. And, and you know, like I, I did play with the idea of making yeah, maybe yeah. Christian like ninja or something like that. Something that's just so dumb, but awesome at the same time. Where it's just like, that's just a ninja, you know, like it's, it, you know, something like that. But but the costume and stuff that we're able to put together. So in the end, we we just like, well, we're just going to come up with our own He-Man Motu sounding names, which I think we did and uh, with these characters. And we'll just let them just be kind of like randos that, hey, maybe they're, they're just part of the universe too, right? Yeah. And, and, and I do have to say, and, and we've had a few questions about Siam. What does that mean? Well, he has an eye patch and so he's got one eye. So... He's a Cyclops, I am, Cy am, you know, so there's that, explains that. Um, Bonin is kind of obviously Conan. We, we were so, inspired by, because we were trying to figure out what to do for his costuming, and so we, we were looking up photos and we found um, Jason Momoa's Conan, and we, so we kind of actually incorporated that kind of theme into his costuming. And so we were just trying to come up with what to call him. And he's got bones around his neck, right? And we're like, what if it's just boning? And he's also like a bonehead. So it's yeah, kind of like, yeah, we're trying you know. to kind of, you know. But, but they each had, and then finally you had Chainmail, who's wearing Chainmail. And so yeah. that was, that just felt very... Very, I, I love that one. But uh, but actually, he has he has a little shout out. If you freeze frame it next time, when the you could really see it in a few shots. But the best shot you could probably see it in is when he when the three of them step in and they're like, "Who's this?" And you get the tree the shot of the trio, um, uh, in that medium uh, wide shot. You get uh, there. He has a painting of skeleton a ske skeleton Skeletor on oh, his oh. Uh, on his pauldron. Oh, and nice. so he's got like the visage of Skeletor indicating, is he out questing for Skeletor, trying to find the sword? So there's a little Easter egg there as far as it goes. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, there was some, Bonin definitely was, he was more of an archetype of beast man, right? Like if we want to say right. who some of these characters are, Siam is probably a little bit more of, um, oh, not Fisto, of, of um, uh, um, Oh my gosh, I could have told you 30 seconds ago. Um, got the golden hand. <laughs> Jitsu. Oh, Jitsu. Yeah. Jitsu. So we yeah, kind yeah. of embodied a couple chainmail's just chainmail. <laughs> I, yeah, know, I don't know. It's, it's just his own thing. <laughs> but like, but we did kind of a little bit embody that a little bit in the creation. Like there was a little bit of that in the in the soup, you can say, but that's more us talking about it. Uh, you're not necessarily going to pick up on that as far as it goes. Maybe Bonin would be the most obvious to pick up on as kind of a beast man type of character. But, um, but you know, outside of that, you know, we it's called budget, time, yes. money, and, you know. And I will say, too, with those costumes, pretty much everything was donated to us. And so that, For them, that yeah. we were super grateful for. Oh. 
Yeah, um, yeah, we got we got a lot of things, and so you're kind of piecing these things together outside of like the eye patch and the uh, and the the uh, the bone necklace yeah. uh, that was. But most of it was but... actually coming from like legit film. Yeah, and stuff, yeah. So... Well, Siam, most his costume was pieced together. Actually, I have a wardrobe person I work with here, and she got those. Those are from the movie Alexander and the more recent Ben Hur. So we Frankenstein some of the stuff together. So those are real screen used yeah. costumes from actual like major Hollywood productions that yeah. we that we put into it. And so, but it you know it, it kind of came together in a fun way as far as it goes. And I will say this, you know, I mentioned the power sword with Tila. At the end of the credits, there is a piece of original vintage art that we put in there in the end credits as a little bit of an Easter egg where Tila is the one wielding the power sword, you know, as He-Man and a few others are kind of behind her. So that artwork is in there. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it was alluding to, but it's there. So... So there you go. I don't know if it's canon, but you know, it's, it's, it is there. So now you're going to like go back into the end credits and be like, huh, there yeah, is yeah. this, you know, as far as it goes. So kind of an interesting little thing. Again, I don't know why, why that artwork, it's definitely official art of some kind. It's definitely not fan art from that period, but I don't know who did it. I don't know what it was putting or what it was for, but we found it and threw it into the, into the fun end credits um, kind of montage. The execution of this project was brilliant. I mean, the end product looks so professional, so incredible. Tila is amazing, and she's so powerful. It it really just sets your uh, imagination on fire. Like, like, wow, why is she? You know, what happened to He Man? Where? You know, she's alone with the power sword. She's protecting it. Maybe she's. You know, uh, it, it just you know, let's your uh let you play with it in your head. Well, well thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. No. And I love that you I love that you said that it leaves so much for the imagination because you know, we only have about five, six minutes to kind of introduce you into this. And so we don't have that before moment of why why does she come there for the power sword, right? <laughs> that kind of leaves it open to interpretation for, right. you know, all the viewers and stuff. Um, but really uh, having us introduce Tila into that circumstance, um, kind of our our goal with that was also to showcase. And when we were doing like research of I was researching Tila, I was like, who is Tila? You know, what type of personality is Tila? And and I read this um, quote on Wikipedia where it, it describes her as quick tempered and a bit reckless, like a, a wild tomboy. <laughs> And uh, and that kind of made me giggle because here she is. She's coming in. She's got three other opponents that are good warriors, you know. And we're really trying to showcase that. Like she's she's in above her head, mm-hmm. but she doesn't quite know it because she's got that sense of quick temperament, you know, that recklessness. Like I got this. This is fun. This is a little challenge for me. This will be a good time, right? And and so we really wanted to showcase that at the intro where she just takes him out, right? Oh no, she's got this. But then it's like, does she have this? You know, and that that kind of uh, you know back and forth uh, throughout the choreography. Is she gonna get the power sword? You know, is she? Yeah, I no no. You reminded me of something actually as you're talking about that, Emily. But I will say this: I mean, her purpose is to get the role. But you know, no, no, that, that's, that's the purpose. That's the number one purpose. Add but the power, add the power, power, add the power, aka the role. But uh, <laughs> but you know, but like coming into it, I actually reminded by this because she was talking about the choreography and these powerful warriors. I mentioned her being body slammed. She was going even in the in the when we had to come back, we were still going to do the body slam. So instead of her getting kicked back, she was going to be picked up by her throat and slammed to the ground still. The oh, wow. problem was why we couldn't do some of that stuff was the chest armor was starting to break from all yeah, this so stuff. Yeah, so we actually did do some some body slams on the day that it was uh, storming. And I really was kind of throwing myself up and down. And because of that, you know, we have leather, we have a 3D print um, chest armor and all this stuff. And it did crack the armor a bit. And uh, fun story, um, (laughs) the day that we really came back to filming, we only have two days and we had that intro fight scene of the never ending um, elbow throws. (laughs) And um, so we're we're going at it. And all of a sudden the, the chest piece busts. It just busts. 
Oh. And uh, we were like, what do we do? Well, we don't have anything. We didn't have anything on us to piece it back together. And um, the armory that we worked with was pretty far away. And so we we just so happened to have our first guy, Chainmail. Um, Elwin. He, yeah, Elwin. Yeah. He actually had just a bag full of uh, everything. And so he's one of those, you know, one-stop shop kind of guys. And so he had Gorilla Tape. He had yeah. super glue. He had a uh, gold Sharpie somehow. And we <laughs> pieced it back together. Kind of like coppery bronze <laughs> yeah. Sharpie. Until we could uh, go. I had to rush over to the armory that night and, and have it re-secured for the second so, day. Yeah, so if you freeze frame a few shots. And don't, look, don't tell no, them no, that. Don't but, tell like, them but if you freeze frame. You're, <laughs> that, no, it happens so quick and all that. Like, I don't even notice it. But if you do freeze frame a few shots, you'll be able to like, oh, my gosh, that thing is like... <laughs> Hold it up. And so so that, so because of that, we had to take away some of the, I, I don't want to say brutality, but some of the, you know, like, yes, Tila was going to take some more punches and kicks, but we yeah. actually had to protect the, the, uh, the merchandise, yes. so to speak. Because we and did not have a backup set of armor. No, no, so. there was nothing like that to go in. So, I mean, this, this is filmmaking, you know what yeah. I mean? And it's, it's kind of, it's organized chaos. Yeah. And then, you know, it's kind of like in Shakespeare and Love, they ask, how does it all happen in the end? I don't know. It's a miracle. You know, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's a mystery. And well, that's. That's kind of how it happens, but it is, it's, it's a lot of fun as far as, I know and, that was a little tangent. But. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say this, it was like at the end of the second day, when we finally got everything, we were just so grateful that we made it through without yeah. it busting again. Yeah. And, and, and one other little secret, there was a, uh, we realized once we put the edit together, we had the edit done a week after we got it done. We realized like, man, we really need to like add a couple little things, just a couple little moments just to make it through. So we organized, um, a few, a couple weeks after we shot, we organized a very quick shoot. And so in about two hours, we added like just a couple small little things um, to kind of connect the whole piece together. Like the great shot where she's like, I'm Tila. And, and then knocks him out one more time with the, uh, with the staff that we did. We did that in a very quick pickup, which we were starting to get panicked that we weren't going to get because the camera wasn't put together and working and the <laughs> sun was going down and it had to look consistent. And there was like, these are, these are the little things, the right? Little that, things. That, that, you that, that shot was very important. Yeah. Um, even though it's pretty obvious me in the, you know, armor and everything that I'm Tila, you know, any fan would know that. Um, but we thought that was also really important to establish, you know, that I'm Tila, right? And especially for the fans that aren't familiar with Masters of the Universe 2 as well. So they might be like, who is this? She who is this? Yeah, I got I've that a couple of times. I'm like, oh, come on, guys. But yeah, I'd love to do more. We are getting a lot of great responses and people want to see more. <laughs> and so and, and we're like, guys, we would love to do more um, for us. It's really a budget thing. We were able to budget this um, despite how it looks for much cheaper than people realize. Um, but that was because a lot of people were doing us some big favors here um, for the love of Masters of the Universe, um, as well as to do it for us, um, since mm -hmm. this was uh, an audition piece that we really wanted it to look good. And so um with with our team and stuff we have a lot of incredible people that that gave their time and gave us some really good you know discounts just to make it happen um, yeah. and i mean well well i want to step in real quick and say who some of those people are like so that people realize some of the quality of what we brought to the table like the sound design uh the sound editor and supervisor was patrick hogan who's a 10 time emmy nominee he did he did <laughs> umbrella academy and cobra kai uh oh, just wow. like, things he did. I met Patrick through my film festival. I mean, my film festival is a huge networking opportunity and event, actually. And and I've, I've kind of underplayed it a little bit, but it, 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 it's built a big network of people that I count on and rely on that are very, very well established professionals in the industry. And Patrick's one of them. So we have literally the Emmy nominated sound team doing the sound design on yeah, this. Yeah, and he brought in his whole team to yeah, work on yeah, this. Yeah. Um, it really was so incredible for us when we got to go to the Paramount lot and finalize the sound with them and being like in the sound room, hearing the optimal sound that nobody really gets to hear unless not even quite, but the most similar would be in the cinema. Our composer is Garrett Wonder, who um, he actually works with, I can't remember her last name, but he's the composing um, partner with, uh, her name's Pinar, 
and I can't remember her last name, but she composed Captain Marvel. Oh, and he wow. was the composer on okay. Stargirl for CW. He composed uh, with her on Slumberland for Netflix. And uh, we don't want to jinx anything. And we don't know the project. He hasn't even told us the project, but he's doing a major, major project that he is the solo composer on for Netflix right now. And but he can't say and he won't show us anything. He doesn't want to <laughs> jinx it. But apparently it's a very, very big animated project. To come back to it, you asked the question of like what our future plans are with this. And I mean, right now the film lives as it lives. And and there it is. I'm not sure we can get at the same price that we got everybody to do everything on this one. <laughs> I don't think we could get them to do it that low again. I, I really don't think we can. And we probably would do a Kickstarter, like we'd make it very clear what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we'd probably do a Kickstarter and say, hey, we need this amount of money. Because I can. I can go to an Oscar winner to do the makeup effects. And he would do it for me for a good price. But there's still material costs, labor costs, mm -hmm. all that, that we just can't avoid. Right? Mm -hmm. But we'd be able to deliver an amazing Skeletor. Mm -hmm. We could deliver an amazing um, Merman or Beast Man, right? Um, yeah. As we said on uh, with uh, Dad at Arms, we told him we'd also probably get, you know, budget conscious and probably do somebody like Jitsu or Ninja or so like mm -hmm. a human that you could just put into a costume. Or right? Man at Arms, um, right? I think would oh, we would definitely be, have Man at Arms, uh, an important one. In fact, that was actually one thing when we were discussing, you know, what the film would be. That was one thing I really, really wish we had. Um, but obviously, budget's budget, and. Uh, I really wanted to have some kind of a moment and some kind of scene with Tila and Man at Arms, um, kind of establishing a little bit more of her story, her backstory. Um, and so that would be something that I definitely would love to, you know, have is a little bit more of that the backstory behind, you know, Tila and stuff like that. But maybe her motivations. Her motivations yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. It's it, it's hard for us to do that in the amount of time. And again, we were also looking at it like, well, it's already five, six minutes. That's that's a long audition. Um, so you know, we don't want to send in a 30 minute thing, yeah. you know, but but you know, if we're doing it just just for the fans and to to make a film and put it out there for everybody, um, yeah, I definitely would like us to really incorporate a lot of these. Uh, important characters and again it comes down to budget and we want to make them look really good and that's one thing we're very adamant about like he said like the makeup effects it's really got to be good and on point we don't want to make something you know cheesy in the sense we want it to look the same feel that of what we created um right. and really have yeah. that that high quality let's, value let's put it this way like this is the way i think and the way i approach such things is when we were on set and we would we were kind of saying it like slightly seriously but also as a joke a little bit because who knows what's out there but we we would say we're making the greatest masters of the universe live action film ever made guys yeah, yeah. that's what we're doing that's what we're trying to do right but that but that was just to keep everybody you know everybody motivation, motivation right? And the spirit, right that's what we were going and that wasn't to be disparaging towards anything else that was that was uh that's been done um but we also said um is uh we're we're ambitious and I'm very ambitious. And if if we were to go out and to do like a, an, a, I say official fan film, like that's what we're going in. It's very clear what we're doing. This is something that's going on YouTube. We would set out not just to make the greatest Motu piece ever made. We'd be going out to set out the greatest fan film period ever made. Like period. Like <laughs> everything else you've ever seen and all that. It's just like, no, we're going to go out and make something you've never seen a fan film do before and just rock your world, right? <laughs> like, that's what we would do. And like, what you saw as Tila is just like a taste of where we can take, it's just a glimpse of do. what we'd want to do, right? <laughs> you know, have more time to perfect some of the shots and sequences, have some, uh, have something really delicious, which everybody can do. And even then though, there would still be some limitations. Like you'd probably keep it to about eight characters. You'd have to still keep your, you know, your location's very smart. You know, it's not like we'd be bi building a facade of Castle Grayskull or anything <laughs> like that, right? But but it's like, there would still be some limitations, but we'd go out and really just like create something that's just like, yeah, you thought we had the power before. <laughs> but we would bring what we, the team that we could bring to it. And so it would be money very, very well spent. So, you know, instead of maybe buying, you know, 
souvenir or collector's item, maybe, maybe, maybe push it towards doing an awesome fan film that you could get your name in the credits with, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Why buy Tila when you can get Tila? Like, exactly. Real Tila. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe signed really... autographs, you know, you do all the perks and stuff like that. No, yeah. exactly. It could be fun for us to come back. Worst, worst comes to worst. Say, hey, guys, we would love to make you something. We want to incorporate all the characters that you love, you know, but this is what we need to do it. And if that's what the fans wanted, that there would be a lot of joy in that, too, as well. Just putting that out there, because, again, um, for us, this is such a unique experience. I've never once put out an audition just in general, any of my auditions out for the public to ever see. Um, but for this, uh, just seeing the responses and everything uh, was really encouraging for me. Um and if nothing was to come from it at the end of the day, it's something that we still have that just getting, you know, that endorsement from you guys, um, the responses from the fans. We we actually had several people reach out and and just say really, autographs. really nice things. Yeah. We had people nice. want uh, screen yeah. grabs, autographed, all these kind of things, things we never really expected. Um, but but for us, that's, you know that's enough for us to feel fulfilled with this but again we're not opposed to maybe someday in the future you know well, yeah and, and and to compliment what emily's saying she's actually said what i wanted to say next was like you know eye on the prize right first and foremost this is an audition let's see where that goes and if all else fails okay let's start talking about you know maybe the the lesson of the week yeah, right yeah. like the lesson of now we can start talking about some of these other things, right? And going from there. Um, but first, we definitely, you know, I think it is important to emphasize we got to we got to see where this goes first. Yeah. And but if there are anybody that are in the powers that be with more money, more time, and more official backing, we have some we have some really cool what I think are really really cool ideas of where we could take like a live action series. Okay, that's all the time we had today. Thank you so much, Emily and Jonathan, for giving us your valuable time. If you enjoyed this interview, we recorded uh, some additional content, uh, so go ahead and check out our Council of the First Ones podcast channel for that bonus video. This is David Clark, owner of adultcollector.org. I invite everyone to check out the 100,000 member He-Man and the Masters of the Universe fans group on Facebook. Until next time, stay safe and good journey. And this is Sean Skavarna, and if you want to hear me talk more shop about Masters of the Universe, jump on over to Legends of Grayskull podcast, where we discuss the history, mystery, magic, and mythology of He-Man and all the various brands that spiraled from it. So until next time, good journey, and congratulations, you two. It was great talking to you, and uh, you know, many, many, many more years of happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you so it. much. And good journey to you all. Good journey.